everybody to this session of the World Bank Fragility Forum 2022, addressing the water, climate and conflict nexus, lessons from Africa and Central Asia. This session is organized by the World Bank and the Water Peace and Security Partnership. My name is Ronin Sasse and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, I'm a water and security expert and I'm also co-founder co of the Water Peace and Security Partnership. WPS is a partnership of five organizations supported by the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs and GIZ. We combine data technology and participatory analysis with capacity building and dialogue in order to enhance uh, local stakeholders to address issues of water security and water and conflict towards peace. Please check out our website for any information. Today, we'll talk about uh, conflicts around climate change and water resources. Conflicts over control and access to natural resources, such as water resources, have emerged as one of the key issues challenging peace and security in many regions worldwide. This plays out from community level uh, to local level and rebellion and civil wars at national level and even sometimes transboundary level. The session will discuss the compound risks and nexus of transboundary and national water resources, climate and conflict in the Fergana Valley uh, and Afghanistan border areas in Central Asia, and in Kenya and the wider Eastern Horn of Africa region. We aim to identify enterprises to better engage at the international country and subnational levels to address identified drivers of fragility, conflict and violence, and to identify sources of resilience relating to water, including transboundary water resources. The session is organized to share key findings from a re recent regional risk and resilience assessment of the Central Asia and Afghanistan border areas. This was carried out by the World Bank, the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the UN led by UNDP, and it was largely funded by the State and Peace Building Fund. The learnings will be compared to experiences of the Water, Peace and Security Partnership, especially in Turkana County in Northern Kenya, but also in the wider uh, Eastern Horn of Africa region. We will have five esteemed panelists today who will share their personal experiences on the water climate and uh, conflict nexus. First, we will look at the context in both regions, after that, we will discuss the learnings the panelists can share on how to address these issues. Um, before we start the sessions, please be aware that you are welcome to ask questions or brief comments through the chat in your uh, screen. So please, uh, we will end this session with a, a Q&A and we'll be happy to receive your questions for that session. So now I'd like to start with round one of our panel discussion, and I will focus on key issues that are at stake in Central Asia and in Eastern uh, Africa. Let me first introduce our first panelist, that is uh, Sasha Jumena. He's country program coordinator for Central Asia for the World Bank. He has been with the World Bank since 2001 and presently oversees the regional engagement programs in the Central Asia region. He has a long experience in the region, especially on issues related to the private sector, such as oil, gas and extractives. Sasha, you've worked extensively in Central Asia. What key challenges and recent trends do you observe with regards to the water resources and security nexus in your region? Hi, Roland. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Um, Indeed, I mean, this is a very pertinent question nowadays, right? Uh, I mean, there are many pertinent questions on regional issues, but clearly water fragility and the uh, potential conflict arising out of the sharing of water and the use of water is key. Um, and thus, uh, the bank and with our partners, some of them here are panelists also, um, we took a look deeper into this particular topic of uh, potential conflict, and that's the uh, use of water, really, right? Um, given that water, as you already mentioned, it's in livelihoods, it's uh, climate change, it's a key driver on irrigation, it's used for energy. So there are a lot of uses of the water, which creates lots of potential conflict. Also, given that, uh, particularly the downstream countries, um, 
face a real dire scarcity of the water if it isn't managed well. And this is clearly where we come in. Uh, there are various ways of looking at it. You can look at it upstream through some of the projects regionally. And I really want to point out the regional approach here rather than in, in addition to the national approaches. Uh, for instance, on, um, on uh, uh, hydromet, data sharing is important. Right? So what you try to build is a sort of trust among the countries, sharing the data so everybody has an understanding how much water is there, when will water come, how much other flows, and so on and so on. Now, in reality, the, our recent risk and resilience assessment identified actually the lack of those type of finding arrangements, sharing uh, information, uh, discussing common transboundary issues and resources, land, water, infrastructure, and even regional dispute uh, resolution mechanisms aren't really there. So these are important drivers for the FCB issue in Central Asia. Like create something that is, is owned by everyone um, and use as a platform to discuss these issues. And that's more or less lacking. Um, uh, if we continue our data on conflict, we recently had an armed conflict location and event data. It shows that um, this incidence of violence uh, conflict are actually not that high, right? I mean, they exist, but there's not there's not a multitude of them, especially in the Kyrgyz Republic, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. However, if you delve in a little bit more deeply, what you see is actually that the cross-border conflicts are the ones that make up more uh, a larger share of the violent conflicts. Uh, you can see recent events between the Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan. And Tajikistan is about 6% and Tajikistan 35%. Cross-border conflict is the key issue here, uh, mm -hmm. often over resources such as water. Um, obviously, I already mentioned it, climate change impacts important also. Um, and I think the key here is, is really to share and understand that data. Right? We have growing aridity, we have melting glaciers, uh, hydrological disasters, a lot of these. And what they lead to is also uh, more migrants moving around. We understand that there's a displacement of, of people, populations, uh, has impact, obviously, as I said already, if irrigation doesn't work correctly on agriculture, food security, and health, and uh, overall general security. Now, the, what we've seen in the RRA is that, particularly in the Fergana Valley, there might be actually in migration, right? It's a fertile area, but that would lead to more uh, conflict in some sense because it's already rather heavily populated area. Mm -hmm. um, so here I go back to my previous point, the one very beginning. Now, in order to have a more peaceful process, a more understanding also among the local communities, it's important um, that there are institutions that cooperate, this co that, that promote cooperation, and, and particularly also dispute resolution. Right at the national level, I think it exists. Each of our projects exists, but I still find that at the regional level, where it really counts, where all the stakeholders mm -hmm. come together, we don't have a process that's uh, that's permanent in some sense. Right, and I mean it may be ad hoc when something happens, but it's not permanent, so preventative uh, in some ways. So what you're saying is at the regional level, you miss this permanent uh, conflict resolution mechanism and a mechanism to share data information. And, and what makes it so complex to address um, this issue? Uh, well, there are always national interests, right? So for, for, for the one, one, one aspect. And I think if there are no outside drivers, there's really um, no sense of urgency to create something regional. There's also cost involved, time, effort, uh, it needs to be sustained. And, and it's easy to have one-off events, which, uh, which are important. They highlight the issue. They, they, they create an awareness. So having regular one-off events is, is really, really uh, very important also. Um, we're having one upcoming on June 6 to 8 in Dushanbe. We have the, uh, what's it, the international, the high-level conference uh, starting off the next international decade of sustainable water development. Uh, I think that's one of the key aspects to raise the issue. People can come. I'm, I'm sure everybody's welcome to attend in Dushanbe. But the key issue is here to discuss this, to create partnerships, and then to, to create something that's more sustainable from these one-off events. Right? Uh, from the bank side, obviously, what we do, we have our commitments. If there's either 20 commitments in the new IDA cycle starting next fiscal year that starts in July, uh, we really have a commitment to support these regional initiatives to help address transboundary drivers and the risks of FCE. That's something that's ingrained, that our um, risk and resilience 
assessment has identified and that we now want to implement. So it's not just reports, it's really let's do something on the ground that's a manageable mechanism uh, that, that is there that people should be aware of that they can that they can go to in case of issues and before they turn into a violence and conflict. Okay, so so you really need this kind of uh, sustainable regional initiatives where people regularly come together, not just ad hoc, but but often. And it's good to hear that the World Bank is committed to support uh, these processes uh, uh, on the along the way. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sasha. And I'd like to proceed to our next panelist, which is Rabinder Gurung, to look to what extent he can see similar situation in Eastern Africa and Kenya region, um, and where he sees some of the difference. Well, Rabinder Gurung is a country director, Kenya and uh, Eastern Horn of Africa for International Alert. And International Alert is one of the partners of Water, Peace and Security and is leading the work in Kenya uh, for the partnership. Uh, Rabindra has over 15 years of experience in Asia and Africa, working on conflict sensitivity, governance and climate security issues. Rabindra, as I said, um, you've been engaged in peace building in East and the Horn of Africa for quite a while now, um, and also in the context of water related conflicts. Do you see similar trends and drivers in your region with regards to the, the water and security ne nexus compared to Central Asia? Thank you, Roland, uh, and it's very uh, my great pleasure to be here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of the uh, colleagues and and the other members joining us today. Yeah, just just to following on what Sasha mentioned. Yeah, we see a lot of similarities between uh, what he explained uh, at the uh, different dynamic, different challenges at the regionals and the the cross uh, border level. We see similar challenges here in the Horn of Africa level as well. So there there is a cross uh, border tensions and challenges that we see, and we often hear in the news, but also it is important to recognize that uh, these conflicts and these challenges are not just limited at the transnational levels because the conflict happens at different levels and impact the situations differently. As Sasha mentioned, uh, mentioned the cross-border conflicts between the two countries, um, between the communities is, is prevalent, but also equally it is important to understand that sometimes the within the country also there is a cross-boundary conflict between the uh, different counties or, government, or, or, or different levels of governments. So we can see that in the Horn of Africa as well. Um, and if you look into this um, dynamics, we have seen a lot of violence and the um, loss of lives uh, in last um, 20 years or so. Uh, that has led to, um, you know, the local conflict and tensions has led to the governments uh, at the higher level to recognize this problem seriously and try to deal uh, at different levels. For example, in 2011, um, then Kenyan President uh, Mwai Kibaki and the Ethiopian Prime Minister Meles Jinawi held crisis talks in Uganda to address some of this uh, violent uh, cross-border conflict that left uh, Scott State. Similar attempts have been made by Uganda and Kenya as well. And as all that had led to the joint partnerships to reduce this kind of cross-border tensions and uh, crisis. But then, this crisis does not limit to the, um, you know, the, the political borders that we see today, because many parts communities that live in these areas are pastoralist, uh, and they have been living their lives uh, moving from one place to another for many many years. Like, uh, and that's their traditional way of life, and they don't recognize this political um, challenge when there is a crisis, drought happens, then there is a flood happens, or then there is a lack of resources. Then they move around to seek uh, better resources, and that push uh, the trigger and causes a lot of um, challenges and conflicts at different levels. So that's why we also have to recognize that uh, at the community levels, the daily realities of many people might be very different than what we talk about the higher uh, transnational levels. Uh, it might be about sovereignty, it might be about use and um, you know the benefits of water at higher level talks. But when it comes to the community level, it's the daily life and how that intersects and um, be impacted by these transnational issues versus how they impact the transnational dynamics is also equally important to understand. And we see a lot of similarities in, in both contexts. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So you, you see um, not just the transboundary, but also the local and sometimes the work at transboundary level, at the high level, you see is not, not connected to what is happening on the local front between communities. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah I can quickly respond to that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it is, yes, it is, uh, as Sasha mentioned, it is important to have those mechanisms, but how, mm -hmm. how effectively those mechanisms are implemented. Uh, I think it's also equally important to understand that because uh, in the Horn of Africa, IGAD has been working uh, to bringing all the eight countries together to address some of these issues at the transnational levels also, but it has not been very successful. So we also have to recognize, uh, you know, the situation at the ground might not be able to wait for the political will to come together to address at the transnational levels. But at the same time, we also have actions to uh, implement so that these challenges and the pockets of violence could be addressed. Yeah, so you need to address it at the local level and not wait for the higher level to, to start the discussion. Um, you also point out, and, and uh, I sense that there's a lot of complexity in uh, water and climate related uh, conflicts. Um, there's so many drivers. Can you tell a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, of course, um, the climate, water and conflict, uh, they are interlinked. Sometimes it's not very straightforward, uh, but then sometimes it also becomes the complexities uh, difficult to understand. And, and I'll give you an example of Turkana. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's in a semi-arid region of Kenya in northern site, which is far away from uh, developments for quite a long time. And if you see this data in 1967 to 2015, the temperature has both the minimum and maximum temperature had increased by at least two to three degrees Celsius. The prolonged drought is uh, repeating. Uh, and this year, the whole Horn of Africa, not just Turkana, but seeing the one of the worst uh, in uh, drought in the recent uh, history. What does that mean is the temperature is rising. The food insecurity um, is increasing. Uh, and it's not just the lack of trial. Sometimes erratic weather patterns means there's a flash flood. Suddenly, um, you know, months there is no water and then suddenly there's a big uh, flood uh, that impacts this uh, safety and security of the communities. So when you see that perspective, people are spending more time looking for water, looking for pasture. And, and this is a county that is far away from the national uh, discussions about the gov government and developments. Uh, and, and, and if you look into all these pictures together, it creates a very complex picture where the communities, uh, where almost 60% communities are pastoralists, um, who are disconnected from the government uh, um, development processes. The weather is, patterns is changing and having a lot of impacts on their daily lifestyles. And then you bring in the weak governance and um, the, the poor capacities, uh, also combined with the poor community water management practices, uh, the political economy around how and who access and owns the water and, and you know, benefit from that, uh, as well as the insecurity that is associated with all these dynamics, because it's a very complex picture um, mm -hmm. that uh, you have to recognize. And then you have to understand the gender dynamics there again, how men and women um, benefit or get affected by all these processes and, and the cultural practices, because this is the community where um, catarate is quite common. And you know, it's a passage of right for many. And, and that has led to the narratives of us versus them, ours versus their. And all this creates a very complex picture. And many times uh, we have to see these complexities as a holistic level. Um, and, and that's important. Okay, so you really need a holistic view because there's so many different factors playing out at the community level as well as in the governance context around it. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, so as I understand from you um, at this moment, you point out there is a big drought in uh, the Horn of Africa and East Africa and um, the issues are urgent. We also hear that uh, there have been many uh, Issues in Central Asia and um, border cross uh, cross border problems. Um, so it's really important that there's action taken. But how? Because with the complexity, the different levels, transboundary partners, um, uh, this is uh, it's not easy to address. And I'm really curious to hear from the different panelists um, how they think, what they've learned, how we can address this, and how the different stakeholders can play a role in this. Um, what have we learned about how to prevent and respond effectively to the conflict risks that climate change and water scarcity produce? Um, this will be the focus of our second uh, panel discussion. Um, we'll have the question and answer and a discussion after the second group. Um, so the second group of panelists will be looking into um, the how questions, how to address it. Um, in this uh, 
context, I'm very happy to have with us today uh, Dinara Ziganshina. She's the acting director of the Scientific Information Center of the Interstate Commission for Water Coordination in Central Asia. It's a regional organization that contributes to uh, fostering transboundary water cooperation in the region. In addition, Dinara is also associate professor at the Tashkent Institute of Irrigation and Agriculture Mechanization Engineers and vice chair of the implementation committee under the UNESCO Convention of the Protection and Use of Transboundary Water Courses in International Lakes. Welcome, Dinara. Um, very happy to have you here. And um, you're in a position that you work with many different stakeholders in all the different uh, 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 functions that you have. Um, you work with stakeholders from different countries in the region on transboundary water issues. What do you think is needed to address the water and transboundary challenges that we've talked about? And in your view, your view, do you think it is most effective to mitigate conflict by supporting local initiatives for dialogue? We just heard Rabinda talking about the importance of community initiatives or rather at a higher level political agreement, for instance, between countries in the region that Sasha actually pointed out is needed to, for the different countries to meet. What is your experience on this and what are your lessons? Thank you very much for the introduction and having me today for this important conversation. Uh, first of all, I would like to start with the certain sensitivity of people in Central Asia to conflict terminology. They would rather avoid the language of conflict prevention and mitigation and use instead the language of the cooperation and interaction. Even in, in a very difficult time of the tension between the countries, they were really reluctant to talk about the conflict. Uh, but turning back to your questions, I would start with introducing our commission, which was established in um, established 30 years ago. We are celebrating um, 30 year anniversary this year, and it's comprised of the national water authorities of five Central Asian countries. And I think the most prominent feature of the commission that it was established immediately after the gaining independence by the countries themselves, and specifically by the water ministers of five Central Asian countries. So. For me, this is the most um, and first and the most important lesson that it's really important to understand the local context and support the initiative that comes from the countries and supported and promoted by the countries, building on home ground institutions and also trying to support people, individuals who wants to make changes. We always, even on transboundary level, we talk about the countries, communities, but I think it's also very important to talk about the individuals. And in Central Asia, you got a lot of examples where, where one individual could make a change. And I think it's important because the countries and people have to feel their own responsibility and ownership. And as we see now in many different um, instances, institutional and any other change are brought, um, brought about by one individual at a time. Transformation is also personal and, and we've seen it in Central Asia too. Uh, so coming back to your second question um, regarding the different scale or level of engagement, rather community or um, state or transboundary level, I think all levels are equally important and they play their own unique and very specific role in shaping the society and the governance structure. And uh, much needed high level uh, political interaction and engagement um, have to be aligned with the exchanges between the professionals and experts and also nourished by field level practices. And through this cross fertilization, I think we could make a real change. And uh, as Sasha mentioned, bringing people together is very important and can be completely different context from the different level. But what is even more important, I would, see, I would say that it's a position of our actions. Hmm. We have okay. to be very systematic. And 
Uh, and also, uh, I think too often we have very chaotic and poorly embedded international system trainings and pi pilot project that was not um, upscale. And I just uh, briefly want to mention a um, positive example of that kind of interaction that was funded by Swiss Development Cooperation that ensure this cross fertilization between different levels and also uh, uh, help to achieve real results in terms of the water savings. When we talk about this process features, we also have to think that we talk about the water and water conservation is very important. So thank you. Thank you. So it's interesting to you uh, that you refer to uh, the importance from the individual level even, you know, where transformation needs to play, take place up to the high, higher level. And um, what you stress that, as, as Sasha said as well, initiatives need to be uh, systematic and long term and not just ad hoc um, projects that come up and go, uh, go away again. Um, is there any specific initiative you highlight? You, you mentioned uh, the Swiss initiative um, that has been particularly successful in uh, bringing stakeholders together. Uh, yeah, I think the beauty of this project that it was uh, implemented at different levels, bringing together ministers at transboundary level, but also implemented by the national water authorities and at field level with the water user associations and farmers that help us to have this cross fertilization when we saw problems at the lowest level, we could talk to the highest level and vice versa. Mm. And uh, another feature that it, for me it's very important, as I mentioned, that it was implemented by the local staff. Very often we invite international consultants even for very obvious uh, assignments that can be uh, even much better implemented by the local staff and they would feel their own ownership and ensure sustainability. And, uh, and I, as I mentioned, uh, I think all projects, at least all water-related projects that even um, try to establish good relations between the countries has to have the performance indicators related to the water saving. And with this project, we saw very high um, indicators of the water saving just implementing soft measures as is improving water use efficiency, water allocation, etc. Okay, good. So you 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 point out that actually this uh, local ownership and and connecting the local level up to the highest level in one project that really made a difference um, to increase the water saving in the region. So that's a good learning point already. And um, thank you very much for that. Um, and we'll come back to you later. Um, I first like to now move to the next panelist, David Rinnert. Um, David is the, de uh, the Deputy Development Director and Governance Advisor for the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in Central Asia. Um, good evening to you. Um, David, um, the UK partnered with the World Bank and the UN to conduct this regional risk and resilience assessment we talked about. Um, can you share some of the key learnings you took away from the, the assessment? Sure, yeah, great. Um, thanks, William. It's great to be here. And I, I, was, I really enjoyed listening to some of the other panelists as well. So I'll build on some of that, I hope. Um, so yeah, I want to focus a bit more on the sort of process of sort of joint working, I guess, and, and, um, and some, some of the background as well of this RRA for those of you listening in who maybe don't know as much about it. So, so I've been here since 2018 in Bishkek. And uh, when I first arrived in the region, I think three things really struck me and sort of regional and sort of joint collaboration on um, kind of peace building and also sort of natural resource management across borders. Um, so first of all, uh, there were a significant amount of sort of small scale projects working on sort of wider peace building issues on sort of water issues. And really, while people were trying to sort of bring these together, I think that wasn't always happening, uh, um, you know, to the extent it could. Um, I think a second issue, and, um, you know, I think Dinara referred to this was, uh, this was about sort of language and different languages and terminologies used, right? I mean, sort of be it the kind of uh, risk and resilience language, the sort of fragility peace building language, or kind of also sort of local stakeholders that has sort of slightly different view on what's the most useful kind of framing. And then last but not least, you know, the sensitivity of raising some of these issues uh, with partner governments as well um, um, uh, and different kind of uh, stakeholders we're working with. So that, that's really, I think, what led to this, um, you know, uh, joint initiative that we launched um, actually a few years back following a workshop. 
Okay, and and what are where are some of the key learnings that 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 you took away from? You did a big assessment, and I understand there came a lot of learnings out. What what struck you? Um, sure, you know, um, you know, repeats are. Uh, I think. Oh, sorry, I think I had a, my my internet in Bishkek was gone. Can you hear me now, Aurelian? Sorry. Yes, I hear you. I hear you. And just I just didn't get, you know, um, this issue of what. You said you uh, initiated this assessment um, together because you saw all these little projects. And, and when the assessment was done, what was one of the key points? Yeah, sorry, sorry for that. I don't know where, I, where you lost me, but yeah, sort of a uh, large amount of projects, different frameworks, languages, and sort of uh, and sort of sensitivities of raising this with, with kind of governments was the kind of background for why the UK got involved. But the kind of key takeaways on on sort of uh, the process, I think, were, were threefold really quickly. Um, I think, first of all, you really get a much better understanding of the key issues when you work together. I think, um, you know, we obviously do our data collection and the World Bank, uh, you know, do their own data collection, but really working together and also kind of listening to local communities, I think, as, as Dinara outlined. Uh, if you do that together, I think it just gave us a lot more data and, and then, you know, pl plenty of examples where it really improved our understanding of, of the key issues. Um, I think the second thing that was really important for me about this, and I think for me really a kind of a model for future working in this area, is that it's more than just a report, this RRA. It really created some sort of a platform, um, uh, you know, um, for sort of future work. And again, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, it, it allowed us to actually join raise some of these issues with governments and I think we really want to build on that because individually it can be sometimes difficult because some of these issues are really sort of problematic and then last but not least um, what was really useful probably one of the most useful um, for me kind of takeaways uh, for the UK I guess was um, the fact that we did a bit of a portfolio review right really looking at the effectiveness of some of these projects not just from our side but kind of comparing notes across UN World Bank and, and sort of FCDO um, because I think we don't we obviously all do our kind of evaluations but we don't always compare, uh, you know, what's coming out of these projects. So that was really kind of helpful. And and very lastly, um, Rolian, um, I mean, obviously it also kind of uh, helped to think a bit about conflict sensitivity across sort of different kind of um, development partners and across different projects and how to embed that. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, that, uh, so actually the analysis, the assessment itself became a very good way of getting a common understanding and exchanging knowledge. Um, between the different uh, participating uh, entities. Now, you mentioned the conflict sensitivity. You have a very briefly. Um, can you say anything about um, how FCDO can support uh, or motivate this conflict sensitivity? Yeah, sure. I mean, conflict sens sensitivity is obviously a huge topic, and I'm sure we've sort of yeah. touched on this in many of the sessions at the forum. But, but I mean, I think uh, the key challenges that I mean that I that I see on the ground, right, uh, in the region, are sort of around. The point that I mentioned on the RA, right, sort of joint understanding of the terminology with different partners, um, the data, the data availability. We really struggle with this, and I think Sasha actually referred to this as well. Unpacking some of these cross-cutting issues. I mean, we talk about water and natural resources, but it's kind of linked to all these other drivers as well. Uh, and I think the biggest challenge probably for all of us sometimes is to actually act on the, um, you know, sort of on the analysis. And I think... Um, uh, just, just, I mean, there are a few examples, but I don't think we have time to expand on them. Um, you know, one other thing that really kind of struck me on the back of the RA is also, um, you know, how can we, A, kind of bring in local voices more? So this is, I think, the point Inara mentioned. But B, how can we link all these different types of analysis we do, right? So if in the FCDO, we also do gender analysis, of course. You know, we do inclusion analysis. We do um, political economy analysis. And, and so there's, for me, because obviously... You know, when we look at these water and natural resource issues and at the kind of uh, the wider fragility issues, they kind of are interlinked with everything else. So how do we move beyond kind of the tick box exercise here? And I think um, just to, to turn that around and then and, and close on, on your point, you know, on, around sort of motivation, uh, um, if we get more organizations involved and broader buy-in, I think through a platform like the RRA, I think that really then motivates, you know, sort of for all of us to actually follow through on, on sort of joint initiatives. And actually, we have a few very specific follow-up actions here. For example, in Kyrgyzstan, we just got together with a slightly wider group of development partners to kind of think about how can we work together to support some of the, these issues at a very specific sort of sub-geographic level, right? For example, in Batken and some of these districts here where some of these issues, um, you know, play out. So so I think um, yeah, those are just some quick thoughts, but I know we're short of time. So back yeah. over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's it's good to see how the RA has, has worked as a platform actually to start bringing those things together, the data and the analysis. Well, um, 
as we did before, we'll also move to the East African uh, region again, um, uh, where similar issues are at stake, as we heard from Rabindra before. And um, I'm now very honored to introduce our final panelist, which is the Right Honorable Senator David Ekwi Ituro. Um, he was the first speaker of the modern Senate of Kenya and the new constitution of Kenya in 2010. And before this time, he served for three consecutive terms in the Kenyan parliament on behalf of the Turkana Central Constituency, and previously to joining uh, politics. Uh, Honorable Atura was a development worker working, among others, with Oxfam GB a while ago. <laughs> um, you're right, Honorable. Um, earlier in the session, Rabindra already talked about some of the challenges with regards to water related conflicts Kenya is facing and which have a, a community focus, very local, but also transboundary issues. Can you share with us whether you recognize these problems of water and climate related conflicts and have you observed? any successes by the government in addressing this to enhance peace in the region. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's good to be here. And uh, the advantage of being the last one is you benefit from the previous contributors. Um, I think Kenya, as we all know, is uh, considered uh, water uh, deficient. And there is no better reflection than the northern part of Kenya, as the director of uh, International Alert stated. Uh, if you just run through a few statistics, 15% rely on unimproved water sources, 41% lack access to basic sanitation, and more than 50% do not have piped water. These are all in spite of government commitments uh, to ensure that, um, in fact, we had a policy as early as 1974 that there should be water to every household by the year 2000, uh, which we didn't realize, but th that commitment become, makes makes the makes the the subject alive, mm. and uh, I used it to good effect. I think in my parliamentary career, and so progress has been made, albeit slowly. Definitely, in the field of Turkana, you can consider it as a, a scarcity. What a scarcity leads to conflict. Uh, the conflict, especially the. Uh, within uh, communities in Kenya and uh, and cross-border communities in Uganda, Southern Sudan, and Ethiopia uh, is about pasture, is about uh, water. So this forces uh, communities to move uh, depending on, on the season. Uh, and this has uh, really caused a lot of uh, losses in terms of lives, and also in terms of uh, livestock, I mean, this is this is a case where water is really life. When there is um, no rainfall, uh, you know, the breeds are not improved. Basically, no rainfall, you have pasture, you have water, you have animals, and people thrive. The cycle now goes the other way. There is no water, animals die. No, I mean, no no rainfall, no water, no pasture. Livestock mm. die, and human beings eventually die. So it is is such a straightforward equation, uh, but in terms so recognition, I, I, I would say the Kenya government has has recognized this as as a big issue. The current regime is uh, investing much more in the dams. Of course, we have issues, uh, challenges about corruption and the rest. Uh, reference has been made to the former president, uh, the third president, Mwai Kibaki. I think he even got some award in 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 France because of the commitment he made, especially with the Watt Act of 2002, which was now aligned to the, constitutional, to the Constitution of 2010 in 2016. And this is where now the, the, the water was made a default function so that it can now be uh, exercised at the sub-county, sub-national sub level, which is the 47 counties uh, we have in Kenya. Hmm. Mm. So now it's at subnational level, and um, with uh, with the changes in the, the Kenyan constitution, uh, with the devolution, um, do you think these issues of water scarcity and conflict they're more in the county level now or central government? Um, where where do you think this responsibility is now? Who can be most effective? Basically, what the what the, the constitution twenty ten did was to assign functions uh, to respective levels of government. 
uh, but generally, all of those uh, functions, the policy level, the, the policy making, kind of the big, the big infrastructural projects like now dams remain at the national level. Uh -huh. the, the county level has more to help with the, you know, abstraction, uh, water use as a cessation. Uh, so there is the, the, there is need to for the two levels to work together, especially in the water sector. And I think that uh, that, that is that is being done. There is also within the the, the constitution uh, a provision for what we call an equalization fund. This is where zero point five percent of the of the ordinary revenues is supposed to be allocated to those uh, marginalized areas in order to develop uh, infrastructure, particularly for water and education. So you can also see a commitment which must be uh, by the national government to ensure that uh, that that is actually well resourced so that it can be realized. But I must, I'll be the first one to admit we have had challenges in terms of mismanagement, in terms of corruption, uh, which, which have delayed the provision. But, but the legal framework is there. Uh, the multiplicity uh, of organizations that are working. We have protected the MAU. I think we need to mention about the MAU water mm -hmm. complex, uh, which is basically the one that feeds into Lake Victoria. And Lake Victoria is a source of uh, River Nile. Uh, that, that has also sometimes caused some political friction. Okay, thank you. So you need both the national level and the county level. Um, and, and the legal construct is there, but now it's about implementation and uh, enforcement of, the, of this system, right? Thank Absolutely. you very much. Thank you very much. That is uh, really helpful. And I think all the panelists um, focused on this importance of collaboration. You can't do it at one level. The local depends on the uh, national and the global, the transnational. So I think this is a key point coming out. Um, now, thank you very much to all the panelists for sharing this first introduction. And I do want to also move to um, questions from the audience. And also maybe you can think of questions you would like to, uh, or any other response you would like to give as a panelist. Um, as mentioned to the audience, please share your remarks or your uh, questions um, in the chat so we can uh, raise them here in the conversation. And first, I'd like to recognize the presence in our audience of the Swiss Special Envoy for Water in Central Asia, His Excellency Ambassador Guy Bonvin. Um, His Excellency Bonvin draws on more than two decades of professional experience in sustainable development and management of water and energy resources. And he has built a broad vision of the water, energy and food nexus. We already mentioned before that the importance of the different drivers from the energy sector or the, the dams for irrigation, for energy, um, the food uh, relationship. So how they uh, all mix together and are relevant to this conversation. At the heart of the mandate of Mr. Bovin is the Swiss Water Diplomacy Initiative, the Blue Peace Central Asia uh, Initiative. Unfortunately, he cannot be live in the session, but he shared with us the following questions. And, and one I would like to pose to Sasha um, uh, on the role of international financial institutions in addressing the water, energy, food, climate change. Uh, what do you think is the role of, of IFIs um, in the regional level, at the regional level on these issues? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Guy for the question. Um, I mean, we play multiple roles, right? So obviously we have, uh, um, I guess, three key areas that I would like to highlight here. One at the national level, one is at the regional level, and one is with our development partners. So this is really, uh, they're the opportunities where we would be ready to provide support. Oftentimes, I think, uh, and the bank, especially also um, as other institutions, we have a competing power. So given that we're relatively neutral in that respect, we can bring together with our partners, bring uh, stakeholders together and offer that neutral platform to discuss sensitive and difficult topics. I think that's one way. After that, we could also back that up with uh, certain financing. So I think that's also important because in the end, we have to realize that there's a cost um, involved in supporting sustainable platforms. And finally, I think what's really important, and I, maybe I'd like to, we haven't mentioned it here today, we have the Central Asia Water and Energy um, Program. It's been going on for a while. It's, it's key. Uh, I think uh, DFID at one point 
or FCD at one point supported it. The, um, the Swiss are supporting it. The EU are supporting it. The US, the various donors to actually gather data because it's important to have a solid conversation with partners and stakeholders based on real data. There's a lot of uh, information flying around. And if you have that data and cover, uh, which I mentioned earlier, the program actually helps build that trust, build the data that you can trust the data and that you can then base decisions on that really, um, that everybody can buy into. And I think that's key, right? So there's a, there's a trust element. There's a, a not among only among partners, but a trust in the data and a trust in the actions that everyone can follow through with. So I think that's something key uh, that this program can establish just by providing the solid scientific data and, and, and knowledge that maybe individuals have and make it available more broad so that everybody's on the same level playing field. And I think that's one role. We have multiple roles, but I mean, here are some that I'd like to highlight. So yeah. thanks to you for raising that question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, he raised one more question, um, which I'd like to, to pose to David. On the role of water diplomacy, um, such as this Swiss initiative, but we also have other initiatives to contribute to the solution to address climate resilience and conflict sensitive water management. Um, David, how do you see it? This role of water diplomacy? How yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a great question. And I think, um, I mean, I, I think I sort of, um, Referred to some of it in my in my earlier um, sort of remarks when we when I spoke about this regional risk and resilience assessment. I think diplomacy is an essential tool, right? I mean, we have obviously the local initiatives, we have programs, we have sort of IFIs contributing, the kind of governments with their initiatives. But I think diplomacy is an essential tool to sort of bring stakeholders together. And we have a lot of experiences in the UK uh, around climate diplomacy, right? Following COP twenty six, uh, where we could really see, including in Central Asia, that you know, on top of sort of the different types of support that, that, that sort of development partners can bring, having a diplomatic sort of uh, track as well can, can make a huge difference, right? If we look at some of the um, sort of outcomes on more ambitious NDCs, national determined contributions, that that was really our experience. And I think it works best. Uh, and I think that's also true for water diplomacy. If you kind of do it at the regional level in Central Asia, right, where you kind of want to bring these stakeholders together and if you sort of do it alongside some of these other tools. So so, so I think it, it's hugely important and it's it's particularly important to sort of do it at the regional level and, and see it as a complement to all the other things that we're doing. So so yeah, I mean, basically just wholeheartedly um, sort of agreeing that that, 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 that that's really important. So yeah, great question. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I just um, would like to bring one question to Rabindra. Rabindra, we've heard Sasha talking about uh, the importance of data and analysis and, and uh, building trust also in this shared knowledge. Maybe I, I can imagine you would like to add some information on, on what your experience has been with how you can use that data and, and knowledge sharing. Mm, um, absolutely, absolutely, Roland. And I think that's a very important point. Uh, and how data and the knowledge uh, fits into the design and um, the delivery of the um, result-oriented actions in water management is, is very key. Uh, at, at Water Business and Security, uh, our approach is also about how do we bring uh, the data, the science, the, uh, the conflict management experience, as well as the water management experience together to bring that cohesive approach in terms of uh, bringing uh, the local ownership, bringing the uh, local need-based approaches, and, and also ensuring that uh, whatever data and evidence that's coming in is actually um, accessible and, and feeding back to the program design uh, at different levels. So we uh, we started our program with understanding the the dynamics, the availability of water resources, the availability of uh, you know um, institutions and structures and mechanism in place to mitigate, uh, manage the water and mitigate the conflict dynamics, as well as how the communities see each other and and from what are the um, dynamics that change the conflict narrative to us the peace narrative. So that's all is um, feed into by our data, our analysis, as well as um, the, the experiences and knowledge that has been produced by different development partners and, and the actors. That has been very crucial for the water peace and um, security um, component of our uh, approach. So at the end, this helps us to collaborate. This helps us to coordinate and this helps us to influence. Right. Thank you very much for explaining that. And I'd like to go to some of the questions here um, from Jena Rosku. Um, maybe, um, I'm not sure, um, Your Excellency Arturo, if you could 
answer this one. Um, do you have experience with the, the Great Green Wall Initiative growing um, as it pertains to the water and climate change challenges in Africa? There is this initiative to to um, build a, a you know create the green wall to stop the desertification in Africa. And and how do you see that uh, as an initiative to uh, to address these challenges? I, I, I guess for us, uh, um, there, there is a commitment. In fact, um, uh, we usually set that day in April, we call tree planting day. And so I can see it uh, uh, along those lines. The, the more elaborate one, which I made reference to, is the Mao, the Mao Forest. Mm -hmm. uh, there is also a commitment generally that um, we need to improve our, our forest cover to at least 10%. Uh, now I think we are doing almost um, five to seven percent. Um, there is something in law that our farmers are not practicing, where ten percent of uh, the farms should actually have a tree cover. Uh, but uh, that one is a big challenge. We 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 don't practice that one. So I, I see it being. Uh, I mean, it's it's one great contribution to the climate change that we are having. Um, uh, Rabindra talked about the drought cycles. Uh, when I, when we were young in the 60s, the drought cycles were like 10 years. Now it is, you are really talking about almost three years. You mm. know, it's, it's threatening to be in a perpetual state of, um, of, of just drought now in our country. Okay, thank you. So yes, you've seen it changing and, and this uh, reforestation and regrowing of the, rebuilding the vegetation is important to address those changes. Um, I have another question from Samantha Games. Um, and um, let me see, maybe Denara, you, you could uh, look at it. Are local or customary mechanisms for resource management helpful for dealing with uh, these issues and resulting conflict nowadays? Has have, do you have experience with how that how they can work and how can they can strengthen um, <coughs> building? Um, yes, I, I can try because for our cultures, uh, customary institution as uh, Mahala, for example, in Uzbekistan, are very relevant and uh, they are very much. Uh, involved in a different uh, kind of conflicts, a resolution if, if it's kind of first a place where people, individuals go if they have different conflicts. And the community engagement is very important in all Central Asian countries. So I would say, yes, they, they indeed have a role to play. And if we talk about trans transboundary cross-border issues, I think this community level engagement are becoming um, more and more important. Uh, but I would also uh, add to this uh, customer institutions also at a different level, probably even higher than national, international level. Pr probably it's, um, it's related to the first question of Ambassador Bonbin on the role of international financial institutions and other international partners. And I think we also have to emphasize the role of law and legal frameworks and agreements and conventions, especially multilateral conventions and, and water convention, for example, which provides a very good shared reference to the countries and also for financial institutions to be guided by the common rules and standards, international standards on transboundary water and national water management, uh, which can be uh, reference point and the right frame for all of us, also in diplomacy, law is a guiding light of the diplomacy. We cannot do any diplomatic stuff without understanding the legal framework. So I think it's very important uh, to remember how important also, in addition to customary, also very formal, probably interaction of the countries and also experts in this regard. And the finally, if I may, I also would like to reflect very briefly on the, your discussion about the data availability. And I think again, here we have to discuss the new technology and new data sources that at least helps us with the sometimes limited access to field data, have remote sensing data that it's used in combination with the field data and data coming from the national authority to have the clear picture. But even more importantly, to have the data, I think how to use it, 
and how to make use of this data and how to make it relevant for the customer. If we talk about farmers, it really has to be uh, localized but in, in climate context. It has to be localized climate or weather um, data. So it's not general temperature in the country. So uh, we, we have to be very, uh, very careful about what kind of data we talk and to whom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a very important uh, addition you just mentioned that it needs to be useful for the users and for the, uh, for the farmers. Um, I think we have time for one last question. I see here one from Amin Des, uh, Desfouli. He says, we've done a study that just came out on the role of climate change in transboundary water conflicts over the tigris Euphrates basin. The picture is very similar to what was discussed here. And I was curious, what are the mechanisms for pursuing multilateral agreements? What would the role of the World Bank be in that process? Well, we have a little bit of time. Sasha, could you, could you reflect on that, on the World Bank role in this? Uh, thank you. Actually, it's a really good question. Um, for Central Asia, obviously, we're happy to work with our partners, right? With the UN, with others, and as there is a role, but it obviously includes uh, our other uh, development partners. Um, having said that, I think one of the longest standing treaties on water, peaceful, is the Indus Treaty. This is actually um, something that uh, at the time uh, between uh, India and Pakistan that the bank had been supportive of and still is the arbiter of. So we do have experience. I'm not sure that's something that uh, is in the immediate future. But uh, clearly, we have the experience of, of such multilateral agreements. At the same time, um, I mean, ideally, the countries themselves would want to find solutions among themselves before going to these types of agreements. I think it's easier uh, for the countries themselves to come to agreement, to agree how to use the water, how to uh, how to um, save the water. We, we know there's droughts. I mean, everybody understands the issue. So, ideally, my view is that. Uh, before we go to multilateral agreements uh, with supported by a bank or others, uh, come to a conclusion uh, uh, among yourselves, uh, among the countries themselves. I think that's, that's, that would be ideal. Um, obviously, we're happy to support that process. So bilateral agreements as well between the countries hmm? um, on the water sharing and water resource management. And the Naira also pointed out the importance of the, the conventions and the, uh, the legal uh, agreements in this context. Um, I think we're moving already to the end of this, uh, this session. Um, and I would, have, I would like to talk a lot more uh, among ourselves on these issues because I feel we just touched on it. Um, we had asked uh, Dr. Susanna Schmeier to close this session, but unfortunately she's traveling and her internet connection was not good enough uh, to join. So I'll just um, do the final uh, wrap up uh, myself and apologize for her. Um, so we've looked, at, we've touched very quickly on many relevant issues. I think um, we saw that uh, uh, it's a very complex, there, a multi-sectoral and multi-level issue, uh, water and conflict. And we need therefore uh, different stakeholders and different areas of expertise and sectors to collaborate um, and to work at both uh, the national transboundary levels, but also at the local level and make sure that there's local ownership. And now I see that uh, His Excellency Arturo has his hands up. So I would like to give one minute to you before I wrap up to say your last words. I, I, I appreciate the time is, is gone, but I, I thought I was attracted by the, the water diplomacy. And I just wanted to mention that there are a lot of experiences from the Nile waters agreements where the especially upstream riparian states uh, are unhappy with the downstream uh, uh, riparian states. Sorry. And so the part of the construction of uh, big projects in um, the damming of river, like the river Omo in, in, by, by Ethiopia is affecting both Kenya and uh, both downstream and, up, and, and upstream. So I just wanted to yeah. mention that. Thank you. So also there we need um, ways to address the transboundary issues between the two countries. We've heard many plenty of examples and I think um, this is just the start of a conversation. We should definitely have uh, uh, more together and we can see a lot of uh, 
cross-regional between Central Asia and East Africa uh, similarities in the issues, um, which is also interesting to see. Um, I thank you very much uh, to the panelists and, of course, the audience of participating in this uh, session um, and sharing in very brief time so much knowledge. And um, I also thank the World Bank and the Water, Peace and Security Partnership for organizing this session and uh, hosting us. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.